Welcome to APAC Weekly, a showcase of conversations on the APAC network with Asia Pacific's brightest minds. I'm Oriel Morrison. In this episode, we discuss the reset of Australia's relationship with Indonesia, why Taiwan holds the key to our digital lives, and the full scale of what's ahead of us to decarbonise. But we begin with a glimpse into the very near future when drones will dominate the skies above us. I asked a global expert about what's coming and how our lives will be impacted. So it's been a game that I've been in now for a good 10 years already. And the way I cut my teeth was using Australian made Aerosond aircraft from Victoria. And we were flying hundreds of kilometers off the coast of Western Australia to do high level photogrammetry for turtle nests. Now, no one would ever really have put defense drones and surveillance and turtles together, except where you take technologies and apply them where they've not been applied before, that's where the magic kind of happens. So if we open up an idea as to how we could use platform technologies for everything from pizza delivery through to getting food to people that are stuck on their roof in a flood, for example, to getting insulin pens to people quickly, to working with things like the Royal Flying Doctors Service and their medicine chest programs, and even some of the projects we're working on from the ANU at the moment involve everything from agricultural surveys, looking at weeds and productivity, all the way through to cyclone um, prevention um, measures that you can put in place and resilience you can build around infrastructure. And then an exciting project I'm involved at the moment is working with the Western Yelangi Rangers using drones and artificial intelligence to map and record areas of rock art and cultural heritage. You know, it seems to me that this is almost unlimited. The positive impact is almost unlimited when it comes to drones. Does this balance off the potential negatives uh, that we have when we look at the future of drones and the concerns, of course, over privacy and surveillance? It's interesting because every country has very different rules around what we consider privacy and what we consider surveillance. So, for example, in Australia, I don't need permission to fly over somebody's land or someone's house, whereas in other parts of the Asia Pacific, I definitely do. There is this idea, though, when we talk about the value of the drone industry, I'd like to just extend that valuation out to the data that's actually being collected from these platform technologies, be they the ones that are flying, ones that are floating, ones that are swimming, ones that are crawling. And we look at the economy from having that kind of data to build a sort of a humanitarian metaverse or an opportunity to have real-time information. One of the things we have already signed up to as an industry are the fair data principles. And so these means that we'll be looking at data collection in an ethical way and working inside the law. There are some places where there is still the technology kind of leads the regulation and that's where you have a grey area where you hope that industry best practice and other parts of regulation actually kick in. And in fact, the insurance industry has always been a pseudo regulator for the drone industry. So people might be concerned about how operations might be taking place commercially, but just be mindful that they are controlled by a number of different types of legislation and regulation, not just air safety regulation. The next big thing to talk about though is noise. If you've ever heard a drone, they're a bit of a buzz. Um, and so here in Australia, we do have some new noise regulations coming in that every commercial drone operator needs to be aware of around the noise that their drones might be making. And then I'd imagine there's new technology that's following that, that's reducing the level of, of noise around, around drones, Catherine. Now, what are the limitations as we stand right now? Because I know that you've said publicly before that this doesn't include the technology. Well, really, the, the limitations are really regulatory driven. So, I mean, one of the things that we've been trying to do and we are doing, Australia is number one in the world for this, by the way. You know, we've had drone legislation now for 20 years. It came out underneath our model aircraft legislation in 2002. And so the idea that we can fly drones beyond line of sight. So we're looking at hundreds of kilometers. Why would you want to deliver something or take imagery of something that's so far away? Well, we know that the tyranny of distance is not only a hurdle, but it's also a massive opportunity for the drone industry. So there are pockets of excellence that are now scaling. The industry in the last 10 years has kind of done that usual dot-com boom type approach where it's kind of mushroom clouded out into being everywhere and everything and everyone's oversold and underdelivered in parts and now it's actually going through that merger and acquisition phase. So it's very interesting to me to see people like Toyota buying drone companies, Boston Dynamics being bought by Hyundai, the car company, the fact that Airbus and Facebook are trialing high altitude pseudo satellite drones in Western Australia to deliver Wi-Fi via laser beam, which sounds a bit Dr. Evil from an Austin Powers movie, but it's actually a genuine opportunity to provide connectivity after an, you know, a cyclone might have knocked out your telecommunications 
to towers, how do you get that immediate connectivity? Well, we've got drones that we can fly in with radio towers or comms um, equipment to be able to, to engage with that community. So you're right, the technology is really leading the regulation, but the regulation does stymie the applications um, because, of course, this is airspace we're talking about when we're talking about flying drones. This is where passenger planes are. This is where people are in aircraft. And one of the things we've learned from driverless vehicles is it's much safer if we just segregate that. So I think what we will find going forwards is we will have drone air corridors. There are already air corridors that have been created for, for humanitarian work in Africa. And corridors are really easily managed when you only have one operator. But what happens if we suddenly have 10 operators? How do we make sure that everyone's operating inside that air corridor? And how also do we make sure that air corridors are not only positioned over areas where people might not be so wealthy as other areas? So, so how do you answer those kind of questions? I mean, you've just raised a number of questions. How do you answer them if indeed technology is leading regulation? Best case practice and an industry that has a desire to do good. So as we move from the fourth industrial revolution to the fifth industrial revolution, you will find now a lot of our business models, particularly around the ESG investing space, will actually be looking to build purpose directly inside their profitability. And so I think if us as individuals are going to see drones flying around, we, we want to understand why they're flying. I mean, if there was a drone ambulance operating like they have developed out of Caltech, you know, if we had drone ambulances rescuing people, I think the social license and the social contract around that is a much easier discussion than someone having their burritos and coffee delivered, mm. potentially. Yeah, potentially. Yes, absolutely. So, Catherine, what does the future look like? If you looked into your crystal ball, what, what do our skies look like? Well, if I was to go so far ahead as to go to the Paralympic and Olympic Games here in Brisbane, I would say we will have drone transport by that stage. We will probably be um, a place in the world that is the first to have drones actually moving people around. Um, and I think that 10 year window is about enough time for our regulation and our technology to actually converge and be able to come up with something. I think the driverless vehicles, if you consider those to be sort of like drones, um, I know that Audi had a trial um, vehicle where you could actually fly in a drone attachment and put it on your roof and take off over the track traffic jam in front of you. I think we've all experienced a traffic jam or two in our life that we'd quite like to have just flown over the top of. I see that becoming a reality to a certain extent. Um, having uh, food and drink and things delivered, you forget something on Valentine's Day and have it sent to your loved one's office window. These things might be more like 15 years away. But the Olympics especially, um, the, the counter drones, I mean, if I was to use a a bit of a term, the anti-drone drone is the new drone. So when we look at the, the big comm games and how they manage the, the drone incursions that they had at the comm games using the anti-drone technology like Drone Shield, which is on the stock exchange, um, and various other Australian companies that are coming out with anti-drone drones. So I think we'll have a more developed and more mature ecosystem in 10 years time. Just days after taking office, Australia's newly elected Prime Minister wasted no time resetting the country's engagement and agenda with regional neighbours. Anthony Albanese prioritised his first bilateral visit to Indonesia. Jason Dacey discussed the significance of that very clear signal with Griffith University's Dr Anne Cullen. I think it's probably better to see this in historical terms. Australia's relationship with Indonesia expands way back into history and predates European occupation. Indonesia, Makassans were our first traders with our First Nations peoples. So this is a reaffirmation that we're seeing and a very important public conversation about our relationship with Indonesia. And it's reaffirming those ties and reaffirming that we want to be, all be good neighbours and that, to me, is a very optimistic way forward. How fractured had the relationship between the two countries become in recent years? Uh, see, I'm not sure that the, it, the relationship was fractured. There's a lot of diplomacy that happens and occurs behind the scenes that isn't necessarily part of our public conversation. And that work was still continuing. It was happening very productively. And we saw Australia and Indonesia progressing through, especially the last few years with COVID, some really tricky times and continuing that very close relationship we have as neighbours. So fractured, I think, is a bit strong. But what is rewarding is that we are turning that public conversation 
into something really positive and thinking about Australia's location, Australia's positioning in Asia and who we, who we have as neighbours. And that's, that's really reassuring. How significant will strong collaboration between Australia and Indonesia be in the context of growing geopolitical instability across the Pacific? Instability is such a big word. It's just not about geostrategic issues. It's also about climate, sustainable energy. It's about food security, water security, all of these different securities. And we share so many common elements with Indonesia in those securities. So it's just not the one, but rather the expanded conversation, I think, that is um, we saw being referenced in that joint communique. And that joint communique, of course, is the solid reaffirmation of, of close relationships. And it's also a promise of moving forward together with, to address our shared concerns. Indonesia, like many nations in the region, faces significant challenges in its journey toward net zero emissions, with a population of more than 270 million growing by 10% every year. The $200 million climate and infrastructure partnership in the joint communique between the two nations would appear to be a strategic play for Australian innovation in renewables to enter this potentially massive marketplace for energy transition. Absolutely. I think Australia has a lot to offer in this area and we have a lot of expertise. Unfortunately, there was that little problem of COVID got in the way of that continued cooperation on renewable energies, finding innovations that work for both, for both nations. And here we go. We've, we're in recovery mode post-COVID and ready to restart that cooperation. And that's going to be for the benefit of both countries not just Australian expertise going to Indonesia, but also Indonesian expertise being shared back into Australia as well. Australia's green credentials were also highlighted, weren't they, when it comes to offering support and advice for the planning of the new capital Nusantara. Mm. Does this again reveal what the Australian government is targeting as key growth sectors for future exports? Absolutely. And, the, and I think a recognition of the grand ambition of this new Nusantara capital city um, being re relocated into Kalimantan is a, a huge undertaking. And there is, you know, we certainly have experience with creating a capital with Canberra and we have lots to offer in ways of, you know, sharing ideas about how to get those green credentials operational in the new capital city for Indonesia. How will the rapidly growing Indonesian economy, predominantly its middle class, translate into increasing influence for Asia Pacific's most populous country over the next two decades? Oh, this is my pet baby subject. By 2030, Indonesia will have 44 million middle class households. How many Australians fit into just that one statistic. And so the yes, absolutely, it, it is makes complete common sense that the economic rise of Indonesia in the very near future will see opportunities for Australian business to engage with this neighbour, to be deeply involved. And that requires relationship building, authentic relationships, not just an invoice signature relationship. All of those business behaviours and cultures we know exist in Asia. We need to continue to develop in Australia and we continue to reappraise where Australia is in our relationship with Indonesia and Asia um, because we are a very different country today than we were last century and personal relationships in business in Asia in Indonesia now are far more plentiful. 
Given the growth that's coming, Indonesia's food demand is expected to quadruple by 2050, for example. Do you anticipate that the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement will become one of Australia's most important trade deals in the decades ahead? I think it's vital. I think it's absolutely fundamental to Australia's success, not with lettuces at $10 a head, but when, you know, we are recovered from all of these, you know, natural disasters, things like food security are fundamental to Indonesians as they are fundamental to Australians. And while we've seen food hikes, we haven't truly seen food insecurity. Indonesia's exactly the same way. They want to make sure they don't see it either. So those trade deals facilitate good common sense trading relationships that we can build upon. We're seeing it occur um, again in that public conversation now more than we've seen it previously, even though it would have been occurring. As the global transition towards net zero emissions continues to gather pace, few of us realise the scale of the task at hand. Professor John Fletcher, head of the Digital Grid Institute at the University of New South Wales, provided some context on what we're up against. OK, well, the biggest challenge we have is the electrification of everything. So taking everything we can change from fossil fuel to feeding it using electrical energy generated by renewables. This is going to be a huge undertaking that's going to last for two or three decades from now. Um, and it presents some great opportunities for engineers and technicians and for business in general. So although it's a big challenge, it offers us some great potential. Well, futurists talk about the Internet of Energy as the net result of a decarbonised world from a city perspective, at least. Tell us what they mean by that. Well, really, it's, it's about using innovative technologies around power converters. Now, power converters sound really technical, but ultimately they allow us to control the flow of energy through our network, which allows us to better utilize that network. At the moment, the electrical energy grid is fairly dumb. There's not a lot of control over how we distribute power. Whereas when we make it smarter and more intelligent, we can use power converters to control that flow of energy through the system and thereby do much more with what we have. Well, as you mentioned, energy transformation is already well underway. How will new and emerging technologies help us speed up the pace of change? Where is the current research expected to make the biggest gains? So some of the really innovative solutions we're looking at in the university sector are things like solid state transformers, which are like our traditional transformers, but they are, they are much more intelligent. They are smaller, they're more compact. We don't have to put them by the side of the road. We can put them in manhole covers. So little bits of technology like that can make a really important impact on how we utilize the grid, how we keep the power quality at the level at which we've got used to, um, and then how we then realize that change from using fossil fuels, burnt in large thermal generation stations, to things like distributed energy resources, rooftop solar, which is very popular in Australia, making sure that when we utilize that resource, we keep the grid stable and secure. Let's talk about electric vehicles, because the market penetration of electric vehicles is one obvious and visible example of the movement towards net zero emissions. But from a mass transit perspective, it would seem the grid will need to be completely rethought to cope with massive surge in, in capacity demand, surely. I think that's certainly true in terms of the energy demand that we'll place on the network. So if we think about the grid and what it supplies today, to deliver electrified transportation, we have to duplicate that again just to give you an idea of the scale of the change that we have to put into our grid infrastructure. But I think we have the technologies to deliver that once we realize that's what we have to do. And I think that's part of the challenge is educating both the public and the politicians and the government what the scale of that investment has to be to deliver that 
really substantial transition from where we are now to where we want to be with electrifying transportation. Yeah, and carrying on from that, one of the counter arguments put forward about moving to 100% renewable energy has been the dangers of relying on intermittent supply. How will this be overcome in the years ahead? And we've seen Australia suffering from this in recent times. Yes, well, it is a really important part of the, 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 the issue and the challenge. When we look at something like Snowy 2.0, part of that is delivering the capability of storing large amounts of energy to do more than just day-to-day -day balancing. We, at the other end of the timescale, we have battery energy storage, which is a solution that might offer us filling in the gaps between one and two hours. And then, of course, we have the capability of generating fuels using uh, electrical energy, things like hydrogen and ammonia. And then when we, can, when we can make fuel, we can then store it and use it on a seasonal variation basis. So again, there are the technologies available to, to deal with these issues. Energy storage at scale, big challenge facing the vision of moving towards complete decarbonisation. So what advances do we need to see here? Well, we need to improve things like fuel cells, which at the moment are still quite inefficient. A fuel cell, when it's operating at its, at its rating, is maybe only 50 or 60 percent efficient. Um, and what, what we have there is a very big um, capability of improving the efficiency. You know, if we go from 50 percent to 75 percent, that makes a huge difference to the efficiency of that, that hydrogen energy cycle. Um, so those are some of the challenges, say, for example, with hydrogen. Um, at the renewables end, again, looking at the rooftop solar um, market and penetration of rooftop solar within our network, one of the really important things we've been working at recently is making sure all the inverters, which are the technical things that connect rooftop solar to our grid, making sure that they all behave together nicely and don't cause instabilities in the system. We've all experienced the benefits of globalisation during the past decades, but the pandemic has also exposed its frailties. Supply chains have been severely impacted, in particular, the production of computer chips, which are at the heart of the world's digital transformation. I spoke to a business leader this week in the country at the centre of the story, Taiwan. The good news story is, is nobody is sitting on their hands, not, neither in, uh, in, in the United States, Taiwan, Europe, or elsewhere. Uh, they're working on addressing uh, these uh, constraints and bottlenecks. So we see an, a, uh, an easing situation going forward. Mm. You, you know, you only need to look at a company like uh, uh, TSMC. This particular company manufactures something like 90% of the world, so the global need for, for high-end chips, which really shows the importance of, of Taiwan within this supply chain. Um, but it's not only the, the key, the electronics components themselves, it's also, again, going back to an earlier point, the transport. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, but Taiwan at the moment controls around 10% of the world's liner fleet. It's a huge container ship operator on a global level. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, and the, the, the wider context that's playing out is uh, the fact that um, Taiwan's experience in moving from the pandemic to the post-COVID endemic phase is uh, a bit slower than, uh, than other major markets. I think that's complicating all kinds of issues, whether it's air cargo, so important to the, the high value products that we're talking about here, or um, sea cargo. Uh, the, 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 the bigger framework of, of Taiwan being uh, later in to the uh, COVID dislocations and now later out are, are exacerbating um, some of those situations. So that's something that the chamber has uh, very forthrightly and strongly called on the government to do what it can um, not just for people flow, 
uh, but for the incredibly important goods logistics in and out of Taiwan. There in, li in lies really the risk, I suppose. You know, when you look at uh, where Taiwan is placed, as we've been discussing within the global supply chain, and how that global dependency is there, how much of a risk then does the China-US relationship play into this for Taiwan? Well, it's certainly in the background, and it's certainly focused attention. Uh, I think we would have had some of these same discussions uh, coming out of the COVID and the, and the Ukraine crisis in any case. Uh, but this framework of, of the strong tension and now we see uh, long-term competition on technological and other fronts uh, between Western nations and, and, and China uh, really focuses on this critical sector because uh, microelectronics in particular uh, are so important. So it gives uh, Taiwan some leverage, uh, but Taiwan must be very sensitive and careful about how it how it uses that uh, that leverage in, in trying to be part of a, a stronger uh, global uh, supply chain, maintaining uh, we would expect um, linkages with 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 China as well. Uh, so it's a delicate balancing act. Uh, but a another strength that I would underscore for Taiwan is there's some real synergies. So just as there are other countries uh, pulling on Taiwan asking for investment in the, in the semiconductor sector. Taiwan has good reason for globalizing and moving off the island, or certainly diversifying out of northern Taiwan to, say, southern Taiwan. Uh, there are rising cost factors, constraints around labor, water, power, talent, that Taiwan uh, needs to overcome to, to increase this sector and go into new sectors. Uh, there also is a need to be closer to the customer. And I think that's driving as much as Beijing-Washington tension, the desire for TSMC, UMC, other players to be uh, closer to their customers. Thank you for joining us on APAC Weekly. I'm Oriel Morrison. To stay across the important conversation shaping our future, visit us at apacnetwork.com.